Too? I can see you. I can't see Anthony. All right, Anthony's behind me. Now. He's going to be sitting off to the side. I've asked him to join me. Okay. Um, I've known Anthony since 2007 when he first did an internship with us at the University of Pittsburgh, Joseph. Oh, okay. Um, you know, anytime I wanted research done, I would just call this guy and he'd have it to me in two, three days. Wow. So, uh, first off, it's an honor for us to be here. But second off, I'd like to thank you for all the information you and Dr. Yeses have provided me with for over all these years. Uh, you know, I'm a fanatic on gathering information. Yeah, right. If you can see behind me, my bookshelves are filled. Yep. And this is like one eighth of the books that <laughs> I have. The rest are at my mother's house in Pittsburgh, and she is constantly bitching at me to get them out of there. <laughs> Eventually, they're gonna, not going to be there one day. Yeah, you know, I think she's already <laughs> thrown some stuff away. <laughs> yeah, my, my, wife, my wife has done that to me. She's like, listen, you got to find somewhere for this crap. Oh, my wife has done the same thing, but my wife is the same woman who'll go on QVC and buy every fitness gadget oh, that's ever different. invented by mankind. That's different. <laughs> yeah, that's a, that's exactly right. That's different. For that's that. different. And, and and the how what you what you uh, will realize is that it's not your house; it's her house. Oh yeah, it's not my paycheck either. No, you're just living there. <laughs> my wife makes the money. You got a role to play. Pay the bills and shut up. That's all. She that's all it is. Just write checks and be quiet and everything will work out. Hey, by the way, I got to give you guys now. This is, I got this. Oh. Is this appropriate? No. <laughs> <laughs> it's from the last administration, so I didn't know. I'm going to choke you. All right, I'll cover it up. Listen to me. <laughs> the last administration had these guys doing 300-yard shuttles, putting them in lactic states. That's, uh, that's not true. You know, it's it's no, right. I, I'm, I'm going to wear it with shame from now on. You guys Don't get, even get me started on that. All right, give me. you guys got to get me a new one. I will, we will send you out a new one, but let me say this. People really need to understand the bioenergetic demands of their sporting activity. Yeah, yeah, Football yeah. is an alactic aerobic sport. What was, the, I, what was the deal with that? Is that across the board, that 300 shuttle? Is that everybody? I blame that on the NSCA. Okay. To be honest with you, Jeff, I don't know if you agree with me. They started that as a test for the energy system for the sport of football. Football is nothing more than a game of repeat acceleration. Right. Average play, five seconds. Average special teams play 7.8 seconds. Yeah. As Charlie said, 0 to 7 seconds, and Dan Path reiterated for me, he said you can go as far as 9 seconds because if you train in the alactic environment, you'll expand the alactic envelope. It's free energy. Yeah. It's the ATP PC system. When do you ever enter into a lactic state in football? Yeah. Never. Never. That's what drives me. You know, you still have coaches telling athletes, we're lifting weights the day after the game to clear lactic acid, from a sport that really isn't lactic. <laughs> you know, the, 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 the soreness you experience after a game is physical trauma yeah. due to a heightened emotional awareness or heightened emotions. Sure. People say, well, we practice. Well, you practice, but practice it ain't the same as a game. No. I don't see guys listening to music, getting hyped up, putting eye black on, painting their faces, and banging their heads off the wall, getting ready to put their practice as they do for a game. Right. Complete. No, you're. You know, the old Bulg old Bulgarians, old Soviet, Eastern Bloc countries. You had two maxes. You had a training max. You had a competition max, right. which is greater. Right. Obviously, competition max, heightened emotional response, and okay. that has to be taken into account. So you're Absolutely. sore the day after a game from emo from physical trauma from a heightened emotional response. You're not sore. Every. I guess you get cancer from lactic acid too. <laughs> I mean, everybody blames lactic acid for, for everything. First of all, it's not lactic acid; it's just lactic. I, it, you get a it's little bit amazed by that, yeah. You, I, I get. You still get amazed at the misinformation on some of the different. You know, it, it just blows your mind. It, it's ridiculous, and that, that's the problem with this country: is academic myopia. Yeah. You know, Mark Twain said it best: "When I find myself on the side of the vast majority, I take a step back and reflect." Amen. And Winston Churchill went further than that. He said, Americans will always figure it out after they try everything else. Yeah, yeah. And, and that's the problem in this country. Great coaches get great results without gimmicks, gimmicks and gadgets. Yeah. I'm here in Arizona. One of the greatest benefits of being here is our PT for the Cardinals is Brett Fisher, mm. who is a genius. And secondly... I'm 20 minutes away from the World Athletic Center and Dan Path. Yeah. And Stuart McMillan. 
yeah. and all the great power speed coaches he has over there. We have visited him probably about six times, uh, and I wish I had more time. Last October during the season, I couldn't get over there, but he had Hank Kraken off from the Neverlands here. I think it's great. I'm doing a book for him, from him. He, let me tell you, Joseph, I read his stuff, and I'm like, you know what? I'm, I'm not that dumb as I thought I was. <laughs> he reaffirmed you. Right? Yeah. And when I go over to see Dan, I went through Frank Rizzo, who you know very well. Yeah, I know Frank. Um, and he's another genius, just like Anthony is. These young guys who I love to hire who are smarter than me. Yeah, right. Educate me constantly. Right. But I reached out to Dan before I even got on a plane to Arizona. Okay. I don't understand how you can be here this close yeah. to this guy yeah. and not visit him. James yeah. Smith, who I think the world of, and the thinker, whose book Applied Sprint Training should be on everybody's desk, lives in Car Charlotte, North Carolina. Uh -huh. We played the Carolina Panthers there last year. He came to my hotel room by 8 o'clock. He stayed till 1. And at 1 o'clock, I just said, you know what, James? I'm 57 years old now. you got to go. I need my sleep. Right. Uh, but it was amazing just sitting there for five, six hours. And James and I are pretty good close personal friends, right. just right. sharing things but talking about training. Yeah. And every time I talk to James, I, every time I talk to Anthony, Frank, I'm, I've opened up conversation with Ryan Flaherty. I'm constantly learning. Yeah. And, and that's what we forget about. Just because I'm on the elite level of my sport does not mean I'm the guru on the mountain. I don't want to be the guru on the mountain. I really don't. People think, well, everybody should be coming to me. No, they shouldn't be coming to me because I'm going out to others sinking information and knowledge. Right. I am going to bring Ryan Flaherty to camp to volunteer for a whole week. He and I talked yesterday for as long as he wants to volunteer during camp because that's an opportunity for me to learn. Now, in 1997, Louis Simmons came to visit me at the University of Pittsburgh, and for four hours he ripped me a new ass. <laughs> now, at that point in time, I could look at myself, which most people would have done, yeah. and said, he's a power lifter, he has no clue what he's talking about. Yeah. Or I could look at myself and say, you know what, you got a lot of to do. Yeah. So. The first book I read was A Science of Practice of Strength Training by Dr. Uh, Zatvorsky, and yeah. then we visited him three on three different occasions Yeah, when we were at Pitt and the Cleveland Browns and drove all the way to Penn State to talk to this guy. Now, here's, again, another insult. Nobody from Penn State has ever asked this guy I know. or visited him. I know. I would be in his office every day asking him how many times a day my guy should fart, Yeah. let alone train. Right. For information. Here's right. one of the greatest minds in the world. Right. And you're not over here asking him questions and right. visiting him at his biomechanics. He's had a biomechanics for the IOC. Yeah. Put your ego away. Right. Because you don't know everything. No. I I'll be the first to admit, I'm an average strength coach. Yeah. But what makes me successful is, number one, I'm still on the floor coaching. So my advice to all young strength coaches, you better learn how to coach for it first before you write programs. Yeah. People look at my programs, and I just basically follow a West Side template and the stuff I learned from Charlie Francis. So we utilize vertical integration periodization concepts. Now, after visiting with Dan, I've expanded upon that a lot. After reading some stuff from Al Vermeil, who was a great legendary strength coach, have you ever seen Al's presentations? You know, he refers highly to Charlie. Yeah. And after looking at the concept of speed enhancement and developing a power speed athlete, what we did was every day we have a hint of high CNS work daily. There's a high CNS day, don't yeah. get me wrong. Then on a low CNS day to maintain the stimulus of the previous day. And like Dan Paff said, acceleration is a skill. If it's important, you got to do it daily. We come back the next day and we do something that has a high CNS component, but it's brief in nature. Mm -hmm. Now, if you've ever heard Al Vermeil speak in his presentations, he talks about an elite sprinter can do back-to-back -back speed days as long as the volume of yardage is less than 300 meters. I don't have elite sprinters. So we adjusted that volume. And what we've done to disperse our volume of high CNS work throughout the week, Yosef and Jeff, is now on our low CNS days, we do explosive med ball throws. Yeah. Let's think about this. They're all concentric in nature anyway, aren't, isn't it? So it just maintains the stimulus of the high CNS day. It gives us further CNS work, but it's still promotes recovery and restoration on a low intensive day. Yeah, right, 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 so right. We've looked at things and said, how can we do this different? 
how can we adapt what we've gained knowledge-wise and adapt it to our environment, our circumstances, and to our athletes? And this brings me to a point that Anthony brought up to me this morning. Is, uh, Anthony picks me up for work now. Um, I only have a Harley. <laughs> That's all my wife gives me. That's all you're allowed to have. That's all I'm allowed to drive. But, but I had surgery like three weeks ago to remove a lump from a certain spot that should be. Right. So I can't get on my Harley. Can't sit down. down on one, right. But I'll tell you this, you said, I had it done Tuesday afternoon after, after I trained my rookies. I made sure yeah. my surgery was after. <laughs> I missed Wednesday only because they put a drain in you. <laughs> and my drain broke and I was bleeding everywhere. Oh. I look like something out of a mass unit. So I, I told my wife, I said, call the doctor. I'm taking this pump out right now. <laughs> and I asked Anthony, I was here Thursday morning training my, my athletes. Oh, yeah. And I was moving rather slowly. Slowly. <laughs> injured. My, my wife will tell you, I lumber. I was less than lumbering. I, I was literally <laughs> cool. and, and, you, and, you, and you might need some of uh, some female uh, product help. <laughs> that, may be, <laughs> that may be the next set step. But right. one thing we looked at is, you know, your central nervous system is your fingerprint for you, the athlete. Yeah. And it's individualized for everybody. Yeah. Don't try to mimic what others do. Or And, and Mel Sith. Anthony was reading Super Training last night, and we talked about this at a car ride to work this morning, and Super Training points that out. If you try to mimic somebody else's movements, you're going to be detrimental to your own. Right. So as Hank Krakenoff says, what perfect style, saying there's a perfect style or technique is like saying there's a, as much as being a perfect human being. Sprinting technique has not trained, changed much since Jesse Owens, has it? No. The thing that we make mistake in the U.S., in the U.S., and I just, again, on Hank Krakenhoff's website, U.S. athletes are always trying to get their guys to mimic the yeah. best. Yeah. That might not work for you. My my go-to exercise may be Jeff's downfall. Yeah. You know, you talk about asymmetries. We're all asymmetrical. I like to talk to these people about there's the biggest asymmet asymmetries you have is in the body cavity, liver, lungs, stomach. How do they explain that? Yeah. If an asymmetry is minor, like Charlie Francis points out late when Charlie was alive, when Ben Johnson sprinted, his left knee pointed out a little bit. We have a guy we drafted to shoot who ran a 4 2 8 in the combine. <laughs> he looks horrendous running. Yeah. What am I going to do? Correct that so he can run a 4 5? Right. It's not, he does what works for him. Yeah. If you look at giving all of us a motor task, we're all going to solve it slightly different. We all fail to take into account the various movement patterns we all use to solve tasks. And we don't all solve them the same. You know, based on an individual's anatomy and some hermetic measurements, everybody's going to do things differently. But that complicates things. We want things to be too simple. And all this talk about movement was talked about in the 1800s by a guy named um, Del, Del Christ and... Um, I forget the other guy's name. Feldenkrais talked about it. Here, let me pull it up. Uh, the two guys were Del Sardi and Del Crozzi and Feldenkrais all talked about moving back in the 1800s. This is nothing new. Why are we making it up to be like, oh, this is new? Right, now, right. I will tell you this, Joseph. The one commonality amongst all athletes is still great movement. I don't care who you are. Yeah. But again, we all move slightly different. Don't try to mimic the best. Yeah. We talk about movement optimality, we should be talking about movement variability. Right. And we, we missed the boat on that. We missed the boat on so many things in this country. So I'm going to go on a rant right now. Oh, I love it. Please Jeff, you and Yosef, please we got you here, coach. Ran away. So we ignore the considerable amount of variation found in human movement. But if you look at time and you look at an elite athlete or any athlete, time is a precious commodity. Do we all agree on that? can't buy it, and you can't get it back. Why waste it? Don't do stuff just to do it. In one of Al Vermeil's presentations, he states, don't waste time trying to obtain, attain the unattainable. And in parentheses, he puts the foot ladder. How brilliant is that? <laughs> and since when did the foot ladder become the speed ladder? Amen. Show me any elite sprinter that takes short, choppy steps. My no. wife's son owns a performance center in Buffalo, New York, of all places. 
I'm not a fan of Buffalo, as you can all tell. <laughs> I figured that out. <laughs> Worst year of my life. I had a gun to my head every day. <laughs> living it. If it wasn't for my two daughters and my, for my mother being alive, I'd have pulled the trigger. <laughs> I feel bad for you, Jeff. You have my greatest sympathy. <laughs> I've never, honestly, bro, I'll never, I've told my wife, Joan's a houser. I'm never going back. <laughs> never, ever going back there. It's too cold. She'll tell you, my husband ran out of Buffalo. I said, correction. I sprinted out of Buffalo. <laughs> as fast as my feet could carry me. But Fred gets these people from this one center up there that calls himself Proformance. This guy who owns Proformance claims to be the youngest strength coach ever hired. I don't know about what university. Okay. He did an internship with the Buffalo Bills. He supposedly developed this gadget that makes everybody run faster. Once again, here we go with gadgets and gimmicks. Yeah. But Fred has started to get athletes from this guy's center because when they retest them in their vertical jump, they're losing an inch or two. <laughs> that should tell you something right there. That's a clue. Yeah, that's a clue. That's a clue. clue. You know, but Fred told me the other day, a couple kids came to his center to be evaluated. And they talk about doing a foot ladder for one hour straight. Ouch. That's just, number one, you're robbing parents of money. And parents are stupid. Yeah. Because they think they hit the speed ladder, and the first thing they say is, why don't you do the speed ladder? Yeah, exactly. And then, then you try to explain yeah. to them, it teaches you to go nowhere fast. <laughs> the fastest people in the world cover 10 yards in five to six steps. When yeah. do they take short, choppy steps and go nowhere? Right. When does any athlete look on the ground? The best video somebody sent me, and I forget the guy who did it. You ever see the video of the guy who said, sports according to the foot ladder? No. Oh, I'm going to have to see this. Oh, I'll have Anthony said it. It's the funniest thing you ever see. When was the last time you saw somebody doing Nicky Shuffle on the field? Exactly. When was the last time you saw, you know, Bonner Chuck and your journey, I'll talk about transferability of training. Exactly. The greatest coaches in the world, James Smith, Ryan Flaherty, even Charlie Weincroft, who I, call, who I met at the Leaders Performance Summit, in, um, in New York this past week, which took two days off of my life just going to New York City. <laughs> and, and Charlie, and I don't always agree with stuff Charlie says, because I don't agree with him with the FMS, the functional, you know, the fun, functional movement screen nonsense. Me neither. But I, I do respect him for his knowledge and his passion. And he's a great guy to be around. I had an athlete lives in the area, I said, try to send him to you as long as you don't have a foot ladder. He laughed and he said, Coach, we don't have a foot ladder. <laughs> but it amazes me. I watched Dan Pass sprinters train and there's no foot ladder. I don't think Charlie ever used a foot ladder. The great ones leave clues. Yeah. The great coaches leave clues. They may not all achieve results the same, but there are biomechanical and physiological truths that they all adhere to. What are the common denominators? Same thing with great sprinters. What's the common denominator? If you ever YouTube Usain Bolt, well, okay, to run fast, he sprints. Okay, yeah. there, there's an eye opener. He throws med balls. I go over to World Athletic Center, there's med balls flying through the air. They lift weights. Okay, there's another uh, shocker. And they do plyos or jumps. Okay, that leaves me. That, that tells me, as Charlie showed years ago on his chart about how to train, a lactic power development. It's right there in front of you. Yeah. Why are you questioning it? It's the same thing. It goes back to the concept of stride length and stride frequency. Pierre Whalen proved that in the early 2000s. It's not stride length and stride frequency that's going to make people faster. It's force production. What's the root? Don't mistake correlation for causation. Stride length and stride frequency are an effect, not a cause of running faster. The more force you put into the ground, the higher your hips raise off the ground. The more ground you're going to cover and spend less time on the ground. Same bolt covers 100 meters and 41, 42 steps. It's not about his stride length. It's about, it's about his force he puts in the ground. He spends 20% of the time on the ground. His ground contact is like 0.08, one thousandth of a second on the ground. That's tremendous force production. Apply more mass-specific force through the proper biomechanical positions right. in ever-decreasing increments of time, and you'll run faster. Right. Hank Krakenoff, Warren Seagrave, Derek Hansen, the late, great Charlie Francis, Dan Path, Ryan Flaherty. The more people I speak to who are really in tune with speed and enhancement of speed all say the same thing. Yes, it's going to improve stride length and stride frequency, but it all comes down to force production. How much force can be applied 
and the great ones are doing it with great force production and ever decreasing very short amounts of time. But that that's what makes them elite. You know, so that's what we've tried to do here. And that's why we write programs based on positional requirements. Based on, we're always telling our athletes, we're either trying to raise the best performance or the work capacity of a specific task at hand, and that's different for each position. Yeah. A big guy can't handle the volume of speed work a small guy can do. We actually do true acceleration work here. We actually do speed work here. We actually run fast here. You're never going to get run fast, run fast, run a medium intensive work. <laughs> There's no speed endurance in football. Why are you running 150s? Why are you running 110? Why are you running 300 yard shuttles? Especially, you ever see a big guy run 300 yard shuttles? It's After awesome. the second turn, it looks ugly. And then you wonder why you got lower back problems. When is the guy, when is a 300 pounder going to run 300 yards? That's why our acceleration work is specific to our position. That's why our tempo work is specific to our positions. Our, our big guys never run more than 50 yards of tempo work. Because we found that after running 50s, they look real bad. Yeah. They can maybe maintain to about 80. Then after that, it starts to go downhill. So why would you allow them to develop bad patterns? You're just reinforcing them. You know, everybody's going to have some type of minor asymmetry. But I think what happens is we don't control training load because we're over-volumized in this country, and that affects those minor asymmetries, makes them bigger. Yeah. But we're all asymmetrical in everything we do. What somebody set up for a squat, how many people set up in a parallel stance? They don't. No. There's going to be a slight DVA. There's going to be a slight, that right foot may be back a little bit. Nobody sets up perfect. Nobody, what I'm going to do is I'm going to start brushing my teeth with my left hand and get on my Harley from the left side instead of the right side. My wife who sleeps on the left side of the bed, if you look at it, I'm going to switch positions with her so I can correct all those things. Right. We have forgotten that the basics are the basics for a reason, because they work. I was talking to one of my athletes yesterday, yesterday uh, Rashad Johnson, who played at Alabama. And when I was done talking to him, and everybody I talk to, Jeff, says the same thing. You know what that comment is? Makes sense. Okay. Training should. should make sense. When do we get to the point where we try to baffle everybody with our brilliance? Yeah. That's why I say, I don't want to be the guru on the mountain. I want to be the guy who hires people smarter than me. Because right. I don't want a bunch of mini-me's running around. There's enough trolls in the world. <laughs> right. I, I, you know, I, I don't need a bunch of mini-me's running around regurgitating everything I say. Yeah. What I want is these guys who come in who are smarter than me to educate me. I can't tell you how many day, times a day I get emails from this, from young coaches. My goal is to be in the NFL. You know what? My goal was never to be in the NFL. My goal was to do the best job at that university, wherever I was at that time. Right. I didn't worry about the NFL. The NFL came, great. And it came back in 2001 and 2004. I sat around for 10 years before the opportunity came again. Did I sit around and cry about it? I went to work and did the best job I could at the University of Pittsburgh and at the University of Buffalo. I sat around for two years being unemployed. Yeah. It irritated me because I see some of these guys out there who are getting jobs. And I'm just, the three guys that followed me and James Smith and Pitt were horrendous. Yeah. Now, the one guy was a great guy. Don't get me wrong. Very nice. He wanted to learn. He just had enough experience. But the first two after James and I left, it was an I know once I'm again over-volumized, doing things just to do them, yeah. running 300-yard shuttles. It, it was not understanding the bioenergetic demands or the sequencing of bioenergetic demands for the sport of football or understanding that as I get closer to the ball, the more strength dominant I am. As I get further away from the ball, the more speed dominant. Now, that doesn't mean my speed guys don't lift weights and it doesn't mean my big guys don't run fast. It's just the volume of work is different for each position. And with Charlie's vertical integration periodization concept, all those components that are inherently involved in developing a power speed athlete are main, there's a hint or a thread of them maintained at all times. So when they're reintroduced, there's not a period of adaptive stiffness or soreness. Training should be seamless from block to block. Yes. Training should not be concrete. Training, as Bruce Lee said, should be like water, very fluid. But we forget that. 
and, and it's enough to really, I quit getting upset about it. Like, it's like I quit, listen, I quit getting upset about these CrossFit idiots either. Yeah. I, I, listen, I go to a normal gym. <laughs> Here's the reason I go to a normal gym. I got diagnosed with psoriatic arthritis. I have psoriasis of the skin. Okay. So when you get psor- psoriatic arthritis, it has deformed both my elbows. My left wrist, I no longer have extension. Wow. It's deformed the last two fingers on my left hand. Wow. My thumbs are deformed. And you can ask Anthony, there's some days I walk in here and people, Bruce Aaron, B.A., our head coach, looks at me and goes, are you going to make it? <laughs> because I'm a stress trainer. Yeah. People respond differently to stress, which as strength coaches, we are now stress managers. We're not, we're, we are physical preparation coaches, but we are more stress managers. So when people encounter stress, they all respond differently, do they not, Jeff? Some people eat, some people drink. I train. Psoriatic arthritis is an inflammatory disease. The more I train, the worse I get. Yeah. And being the dumbass that I am and the <laughs> hard-headed meathead, I forget that. <laughs> so my point is, and I forget my point now. <laughs> <laughs> That's uh, not a stress manager. I-, I go to a normal gym. So anyway, get these people over there who are these CrossFit nuts who come up with, the, with their 12-gallon jug of water yeah. with their belt, their knee sleeves, their elbow sleeves, with... Uh, Kinesio tape on both shoulders, both arms. I think they have their balls kinesio taped half of them. <laughs> <laughs> they really think their workout is more important than you. Yeah. So they set up five stations in a row, and they go through these absurd circuits, and you can't interrupt their circuit. Right. So some lady set up a towel on a machine one day, my wife is pretty yoked. She's getting ready for nationals figures. I mean, at 56, I've seen my wife grab 50-pound dumbbells and do eight reps dumbbell incline wow. at 56 years of age. Wow. I've seen guys not be able to do that. Right. But this girl got upset, and my wife just looked at her and said, are you getting ready for the Olympics? The girl goes, no. Are you an elite athlete? My wife goes, and the girl goes, no. Then my wife says, you're going to share your station now. <laughs> right, right. But I, I quit getting upset at that, too, yeah. because I just laugh. You have to. Because all they want to do is pound their chest and say, I'm tougher than you, I train today. Yeah. The notion of, if I'm sore, I had a great workout, yeah. and I should drag myself out of the gym vomiting with my tongue dragging on the ground. First of all, vomiting is a maladaptation to training. You can only challenge the system as it's capable of being challenged. Right. I can introduce, you introduce something new, you're going to be sore. Yeah. You introduce something the body is not ready for, you're going to be sore. You're going to be hurting. Yeah. So when you train elite athletes, you can't make that mistake. Yeah. I got guys who are 22. Carson Palmer's 34 years of age this year. Can you train the same? They all got this long history of injuries because they've been playing the sport yeah. since they were eight. It's a cumulative trauma over time. Yeah. Zebras don't get ulcer. The book I just started reading. And Zapolsky makes this reference. We are dying from diseases that are accumulated over time. And stress is one of those diseases. How we deal with stress is highly individualized. How each individual deals with the stress of training is highly individualized. Like Dan Path told me a long time ago, the functional movement screen has been around forever. It's called watching your athletes move. (laughs) If you take the time to truly warm your athletes up, we came here, trust me, the first time my guys did an active dynamic warm up for a speed day, they were gassed. Yeah. I'm like, we're gonna be, we're gonna train, we're gonna warm up to train. We're not gonna train to warm up. It's gonna be general to specific. You're not just gonna come in a weight room and start squatting, and that's your warm up. Right. You're gonna go through a series of foam rolling and, a- and activation and mobility and flexibility movements. You're gonna go through primers that help get you ready for that movement. Then we'll get to that movement. And as we've taught them here. Weights always follow speed. Right. What is most taxing to a neuromuscular? From a neuromuscular synchronization standpoint to a muscle dynamic activity standpoint, I just wrote an article for Joel Jameson, Eight Weeks Out, so I'm going to publish a book that Ryan Williams and I did because we've expanded upon and improved it, yeah. and we put together a video course. I talked about weights should be done last. Yeah. Speed work should be done first. Three to five times ground reaction forces, seven times in excess of musculoskeletal forces when you sprint. Yeah. People forget about that. Yeah. First thing people do when you tell them they need to get strong is what, Jeff? I need to lift weights. 
only one way to get strong. There's many different ways to get strong. And especially for an athlete, your strongest athlete isn't your best athlete. No. He's in the middle of the road for everything. That's where we want our guys. We want them in the middle of the road of everything. We want them to be good at everything, not just one thing. So, yes, we want our fast guys to be strong. Yes, we want our strong guys to be fast. We also understand that very early in, in the athlete's career, the stronger they get, the faster they will get. But I'm a firm believer that as they get more elite and the room for improvement becomes less and less. And understand this, when you train your athletes, their maximum output really doesn't change much. <laughs> However, their usable amount of that maximal output can change drastically if they're trained properly. So if you look at speed enhancement, which is one biomotor ability that every athlete wants, the central nervous system is the most sensitive from 14 to 20. It's very plastic. There are windows of opportunity for male and female athletes for speed. For females, it's 6 to 8 and 11 to 13. For males, it's 7 to 9 and 13 to 16. We need to take advantage of those opportunities. Like Charlie said, we spend too much time in medium intensive work, which people are not going to get fast from that. Once again, it goes back to being able to target the training method, to target the training goal and do everything to support the development of that goal. So when we came here, you know, we developed a mission statement. And that mission statement was quite simply, it's our job to help our athletes attain or achieve the highest level of physical preparation using methods and means that yield the highest possible results at the lowest cost. Sporting activity is the highest cost they'll ever do. Football is a collision sport. How can I support my guys in the development of their skill and technical application and technical and tactical abilities on the field through what we do in a weight room? And that's what we've tried to do. We've tried to create a better athlete. So you asked me a long time ago, Yusuf, do you think the athletes can get better? Absolutely. There's, yeah, that's a, there's no question. That's not common from what I understand in the NFL. A lot of guys are saying, well, I just don't want them to get hurt or, you know, we got to just don't screw them up. But I think they can get better. And I think you agree, right? We, we haven't had a knock on wood by the grace of God. We haven't had anybody get injured in GPP, which is what training is. Yeah. If training moves from GPP to SPP and there's that smooth transition or that seamless effect, if you take the time to do a warm up properly, they're ready to go. Yeah. You know, muscles are incapable of producing great force and velocity unless they're internally heated to at least 106 degrees. Yeah. We do a med ball warm up for our upper, our upper body that is extensive in nature, but these guys are thoroughly warmed up. Last year, by the grace of God, we didn't have any shoulder issues. Yeah. And we don't press overhead. We're an Olympic lift here. And I think Olympic lifting is one of the greatest sports in the world. But as Abba J have told James, Leave Olympic lifting for Olympic lifters. Leave football to football players. We have enough in getting... Uh, the only way we're going to get better in our sport is to do the sport, so how can I support that, especially on the elite level? If Olympic lifting made you a better athlete, then why don't we recruit Olympic lifters to play football? And why don't Olympic lifters play football in the offseason? Because if A equals B, then B got equal A. Right. Again, I'm not against it. But if you look at a motor unit involvement chart, it is the highest Olympic lifts. But it's no higher than maximum effort sprints, plyos, and explosive med ball throws, which is easier, which is easier to teach, which is easier and a lower cost to the system. Again, in my opinion, it's what we do. You don't have to. You don't have to agree with it. I don't care. I'm not going to argue with you anymore. We can debate it from here till now, to the end of time. It's like debating. You put a Christian and an antichrist and, a, and an atheist in the same room. Nobody's going to win. Did you ever read the, three, the book Three the Three Christ at Ypsilanti? They took three guys who so I thought they were Jesus Christ, put them in the same room together. <laughs> I'd like to be in that fucking room. Right. <laughs> you need some good. That would have been great. Right. So listen, if you want an Olympic lift, Olympic lift. I don't care. Yeah. I'm not going to change your mind. I don't want to change your mind. Right. You do what you think works. Right. Many roads lead to Rome, nothing is set in stone. Yeah. And the only things that are set in stone, the Ten Commandments, we break every day. Right. So. Do what works best for you. Adapt your program to your environment, your circumstances, to your athlete. 
If you're comfortable doing it, great, do it. I'm not comfortable doing it. I'd rather take another route. And the route that I take, I believe, is a lower cost. And again, James Smith, who I, I think is one of the brightest men in the world when it comes to programming and training, wrote a whole article, a whole paper on why there's no need to lift the lift for football players. The notion that, again, academic myopia, teach you only what we want you to know, that the only way to become fast and explosive is to, is to Olympic lift is ridiculous. Yeah. There's many ways. There's many ways to accomplish a lot of things. Right. Don't, don't put the blinders on. Once you put the blinders on, you're dead in the water. Right. So, I mean, that's the things we've tried to bring to Arizona. Uh, the players have all bought into it and love it because they're being programmed differently by position. And that's very individualized. Because, you know, what works for one might not work for another. So we've got to find what works for each individual athlete. There's a lot of individualization going on here also, yeah. especially when it's level with our older athletes. Right, right, right. you got a lot of orthopedic issues with everybody across no the question. Earth. Everybody's already had a surgery or two. or Surgery two, that's a mistake. Or ten. Yeah. And you've got to remember this. The CBA has really set the spring coach up for failure. We have an eight-week off-season program. Right. Two weeks of we're strength and conditioning only. Now, let me ask you this, Jeff. Can you prepare an athlete in two weeks for anything? I'm not allowed to see my guys after the season to the third week of April when the voluntary off-season program lasts or starts. Yeah. It's a dead period. Yeah. I don't know where they're at. Now, if they go to their own performance guru, at least they're doing something. Yeah. But there's very few of those performance gurus that I trust. Yeah. Or I see, because uh, you go on TV or you go on YouTube, you see these guys doing high lactic work yeah they're pushing a heavy sled for 40 meters <laughs> really why don't you just push it for five meters give him a 30 second rest and then push it again right so you maintain maximal power outputs right so you maintain or expand that a lactic envelope why are you put them in a lactic environment when they'll never be in a lactic environment in their life in this sporting activity right so we are we're handcuffed and in the atlanta fell i'll tell you we spend millions of dollars every year on soft tissue injuries. <laughs> I can tell you why. <laughs> it, it's not too hard to figure out. No. Change, and maybe the, if you're going to go nine weeks and you want them to have more time off, then give the strength and conditioning staff or the physical preparation or the stress manager staff the first four weeks. And then go to OTAs and then mandatory minicamp. And I guarantee you'll see a difference. Yeah. But again, they never asked a strength coach or physical preparation coach what they thought. Right. We're the ones responsible. We're the ones low on a chain and totem pole. I realize that. Yeah. We're the first ones who everybody points the figure at. Yeah. Okay. What can you do with your guys in two weeks to get them ready? Yeah. No. Especially guys who are at different levels of readiness when they get here. Right. Some guys take more time off. Right. Some guys have been to a program where, listen, in the month of January and February, why do you got your guys doing change of direction? It's too soon. Yeah. They're going to get enough of that when they come to camp. Why even bother doing it? I've never done program agility work since 2001. I think it's a waste of time. Oh. Cal Dietz in his book, Triphasia Training, proved that. He took a group of athletes. One group did the pro shuttle drill, and that's all they did. The second group, all you did was train them eccentrically and with static work in a weight room. Guess who made the best improvements? Weight room group. They didn't even do this pro shuttle drill. Yeah. So why don't you constantly do program the agility when nothing in sporting activity is programmed? It's all chaotic. Exactly. So we've decided to step away from that. Now, we use many different movement patterns in our active dynamic warm-up. Don't get me wrong. And we eccentrics in our program as with static holds because we understand that all three of those contractions are patterned differently by the brain which is what people forget so we will address all three of those contractions in our training which leads up to our final block of just regular dynamic work but we're always revisiting those contractions at some point in time during the year so they're maintained in place yeah that that's uh, an interesting um, you know because what I wanted, you know, people that, that, that listen to what we do, I wanted people to hear from an insider, you know, how it really works. Uh, it's not what you think. And it's listen to what I tell a lot of people. It's not what you think, number one. Uh, number two, uh, just because somebody's in the NFL does not mean that they're a high-level expert. 
no. in, in their field. And uh, that's not an insult to any strength coach. No, no, it's not. Because here, here's the reality, and, and this is what I've tried to get across to people. We don't study athletes in the United States. No, we don't. So we don't have when, – when, I don't like it when people say, well – you know, our, our science is terrible in this. We don't, we don't study it. We don't have a science in studying no, athletes. There's no such thing. There's no university in the United States that studied even medium-level athletes, leave alone elite athletes. And the, the further misconception is that because a player's on the, in the NFL, he's a high-level athlete. Not the case. No. He's a genetic freak, but he's not a high-level athlete. Anthony says they're very elite in their sporting activity, but they're non-elite in their training Right. And nutritional habits. Exactly. Exactly. And that's why we're, we take it an ordinary amount of time before every workout, we explain to our athletes what the purpose of the workout is. Yeah. Because if you create awareness and you make them aware of what they're doing and why they're doing, you create cognition, cognition creates motor learning. Right. But they take more of an ownership. Sure. And they begin to understand what you're doing and why you're doing it is to benefit them. So they can prolong their career, so they can become better at the technical application of their activity. Right. And so we can win football games and championships. But we've taken the time to educate. One thing we do is every week when I can't see my guys, is I have Anthony send out a motivational statement. First week, we sent out something I got from John Wooten, great UCLA basketball coach. Be confident enough to compete but humble enough to train and prepare. Yeah. And then, you know, I have Roger Kingdom on staff, two-time Olympic gold medalist. Yeah, he thought awesome. something even better. Yeah, that's cool. Don't be disappointed with the results you get from the work you did not do. <laughs> one of my favorites. I'm going to have that tattooed on my back. Yeah, that's one of my favorites. <laughs> that, but that says it all. Yep. You know? And the second thing we sent out, I had Anthony send it out uh, last week, was tips on recovery. And one of the most important recovery methods we have as human beings, and we talk about cold tubs, hot, cold contrast. Yeah. We talk about Normatex. We talk about submyofascial release. We talk about hands-on therapy, which I don't think you can ever replace. It's great. We have a, a Johnny Walker who does a great job here with our guys. We talk about all these advanced recovery methods. The greatest recovery method that we possess as human beings, that's it, Jeff, is in a built into the system. Yeah. It's called sleep. Yeah. Last year when I would do bed check, it would amaze me. So Anthony's put together a whole thing on sleep for our guys. Yeah. To educate. But it amazed me. I'd go into this one athlete's room, 11 o'clock at night, curfew. He's got a cell phone in the left hand, earpiece in the left, and he's got a controller for a video game in his right hand. Talk about being sympathetic dominant. And, you know, I go back to telling people I could cure all these movement dysfunctions that we say we have in this world, get rid of computers. Yeah. When was that time you saw a kid go out and play? Yeah. Where the body solves motor patterns in a chaotic environment. Remember growing up, red light, green light. Yeah. Acceleration, deceleration. Yeah. Remember tag. Remember hide and go seek. Remember climbing a tree. We truly suffer from, and I'm going to get on my soapbox here real quick. I call it, Jeff, the musical chair syndrome. I'm 58 years old. Okay, I walked uphill both directions to a 400 mile windstorm and snow when I went to school in the morning. Okay, we played musical chairs when I was growing up. 30 kids, 29 chairs. Music stopped. You fought like hell to get that last. <laughs> right. If you didn't get it, you sat your ass down and dealt with it. Nowadays, 30 kids, 30 chairs. Everybody gets a chair. Let's talk about how you feel after we're done. Right. And if you don't like the chair, we'll get you a better chair. Yeah. That ain't reality. When I played Bronco and Booster baseball, you tried out. Every Sunday you went to the church, and there was a list of who got cut and who made it. Right. If you got cut, you had to come back and try it again. That's reality. Now everybody makes the team, everybody got to play, and everybody gets a trophy. And then we wonder why as a society we have this generation of entitlement. I just graduated from high, from college. I'm entitled to a hundred thousand dollar a year job with a cell phone, five weeks vacation, yeah, and a car. Yeah. <laughs> when we talked when I when I told Anthony uh, I want to bring you in as an intern, two things. 
I will not talk to anybody if their first question is, how much time off do I get? Yeah, right. Time off. We're, we're preparation coaches. Our life is dictated by the word grind. Yeah. If you're worried about time off, you're in the wrong profession. Right. And I told Anthony, and he said, I'm all in. And the second thing I made, I made him, I did was, and this is one of my best stories, is I made a point to call Dan Mullins and Rick Court, head football coach at Mississippi State, head strength coach at Mississippi State. You know, Dan Mullins, you're getting a great guy, very knowledgeable, we're going to miss him. Here's the best story. I called Rick Court. I said, Rick, Buddy Morris, head physical preparation coach, Arizona Cardinals. Oh, yeah, but I know who you are. You have some small presentries. I said, I'm taking Anthony Paroli off you. You motherfucker. That was his first comment to me. <laughs> that told me everything I needed to hear about Anthony. Yeah. That told me, I'm like, oh, I got a good one now. <laughs> but that's the way. Don't sugarcoat me, Rick. Right. Don't hit me with the pleasantries. Yeah, right. Tell me how you really feel. Right, right. I laugh for 45 minutes after, <laughs> but I have ultimate respect for Rick Court. Because you get some guys who be very formal and businesslike. Yeah. Right. You know, like British people. Yeah. I just attended that Leaders Performance Summit in New York, which I told you was great. It was tremendous. But I had to wear a suit, jacket, and a collar every day. Wow. Oh, my God. <laughs> so every British guy I saw because they're so formal. You know, they're so proper. Yeah. You know, me, I wear a sleeveless T-shirt every day. I don't have a sleeveless T-shirt on. And the weight room players ask, what's wrong with you today? Yeah. <laughs> I think between Charles Poliquin and I, we need to battle each other for who has the best sleeveless attire. Right, right. You know, because he's the same, he's the same way. But what <laughs> really impressed me was how Rick reacted. That's reality. Yeah, right. Tell me how you really feel. Don't don't try to be yeah. professional. I don't want to. We don't, we're not this. Yeah, we're professionals, but you ever been in a weight room? Yeah. How many guys have not dropped an F-bomb? Yeah. So you get upset when you hear me speak and I say to fuck? All right. You really get upset about that? Yeah. I guarantee you, if you're in a heat of moment with your girlfriend, you like to hear that word. Yeah. Right. And I guarantee you, you've dropped a few of them in a weight room. Right. So don't get upset. Jeff, Jeff, Jeff dropped that that from him in himself. He, he, yeah, he, it, it just, it's part of what we do. Right, right. You know, I like to see some strength coach say frick or frack or fudge, <laughs> you know, when they're trying to motivate somebody. Could, <laughs> could you stand around? I, we, have, we drafted uh, David Johnson, our running back, who you talk about a man child. Now, here's what I talk about adjusting the program to him. He's built, he's rocked up, he's yoked up like a bodybuilder. My fear is getting him too muscular. And you read in super training where the musculoskeletal system outruns the vascular system. Right. So their ability to recover is less. Right. I'm fearful and I'm very cautious of his programming because I don't need this kid to get more muscular. Yeah. He doesn't need that. He needs to be stronger relative strength-wise, but he does not need to be more muscular because right. I'm just setting him up for failure. Right. So how we program for him is different. We identified that right away. Yeah. Mid kid walked in. We identified that. Anthony and I looked at each other and said, now we got to be cautious here. Yeah. You know? Yeah. So that, again, is adjusting the program to the athlete instead of making the athlete adjust to the program. It's like this. My workout is on a piece of paper. But... As Dan Paff said, the best coaches are the ones that can make adjustments. Just because it's written on paper doesn't mean it's going to be done. Exactly. What are they starting to display to me? Your athletes will display to you how they feel and what they need. And if I see things, longer contact on the ground or in speed work, we shut it down. We'll make it up somewhere else. It's yeah. our job as physical preparation coaches or stress managers, through our heightened awareness and observation, and problem-solving abilities to make optimal that training, that training on that day. That's our job. Just because it's written on paper doesn't mean it has to be done. Right. We're okay. always. You know, I had, today I made adjustments with two of our, our our older veterans in the weight room today. Yeah. I told Anthony I'm gonna cut this out, but I want to add this in. So once you put something in, something has to come out. Yeah. So we made an adjustment, which I thought, which were, the guys felt really great. Which reminds me, when guys are done training, they should look at you and say, "I feel good." Yes. That's yes. useless. Yes. They should be in, not in a period of distress. Yeah. They're like, "Oh my God, am I beat up?" Yeah. That's not training. Yeah. That's CrossFit. Yeah. 
And if you'll notice, now there's CrossFit for football. Yeah. Pregnant women. Yeah. Small farm animals. Right. <laughs> there's CrossFits for everything. Yeah. Right. And it's all the same thing across the board. Right, 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 right. You know? Come on, America, wake up. Yeah. There, there is no magic out there. The yeah. Russians are not holding some top secret double probation exercise. No. Verkushansky said it back in the 80s. There are no new exercises. No. None. There's nothing new. There's nothing new. So quit trying to reinvent the wheel. Yeah. Quit trying to be the guru on the mountain. You know, Zatsworski talked about bilateral deficit when I visited him back in 1998. But here's the key about the bilateral deficit. It doesn't exist in an elite athlete. Right. The elite athlete's body has figured things out right. because of their mastery of the sporting activity. Right. Now, does that mean I don't train my guys single leg? I didn't say that. I didn't say that, but you have to understand that deficit does not, and in what I've seen from talking to Dr. Z, that doesn't exist in an elite athlete. And it's it's not the it's not an objective like a lot of things. And I, I tell this to to guy, younger guys, it you know, making these things like what you talked about earlier. They're modeling people, and then they say, okay, well, we got to train for this and that. Look. If you train properly, a lot of the things are byproducts, you know, so the right. good positive things are byproducts. They'll happen. You don't got to worry about it. They talk about asymmetry. Just if you're training properly and using the right technique and, you're, and, and the right volumes and everything else, that'll just happen. And if you control your training load. Exactly. Just don't go, don't be, I, I, and Jeff can tell you how many times I tell him. He'll ask me a question like, what do you think about that? I'm like, listen, number one, don't be stupid. Don't overthink it. You don't overthink. Don't be stupid. Because it's really, actually, it, it's 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 kind of interesting in the sense that uh, it's it, it, the science part is just as complicated as neuroscience. However, the practice thereof and using the principles is not as complicated. No. Once you know the principles, then you say, okay. And just what you talked about uh, just a moment ago, I tell Jeff, he's like, well, we're going to, what do you think if I try this? I said, and, and I'll say, okay, try this. I said, if it don't work, stop. Yes, it's all. Because I might be wrong. How hard is that, Yosef? Yeah, stop. I, I, you know, like, it's not in stone. You know, we just had the conversation, what, last week? Uh, you, we were talking about a kid he's worked with, and I said, okay, well, if it doesn't work, <laughs> let me know, because I don't know if it's going to work. That's exactly right. We don't, listen, first of all, define your objective of training. Yeah, right. People ask me, how do you use med balls? I said, depends. Yeah, exactly. It depends on what I'm trying to accomplish. Exactly. Is it neuromuscular reactive training off the wall? Is it force absorption? Is it accelerated power? Right. Am I contrasting it with a bench press? Yeah. For example, we took a, a concept from Christian Thibodeau, yeah. and we call, he called it the insider contrast method. We just call it contrast, triple contrast, where they'll do a heavy set on a bench, like at 80%, fall on Prolopin's chart, rest a minute, drop to 60%, fall on Prolopin's chart, no more than three reps, rest 60 seconds, lay on their back, feet up in the air, have somebody drop a heavy med ball where that's true accelerated power. Yeah. They don't have to decelerate the med ball. Yeah. You'll develop excel you'll develop great power and explosiveness doing stuff like that. Yeah. But there's a time and place for that. What's the progression before it? You just can't start off doing that stuff no. like that. But that's what people do. No. Don't give them things they're not ready for because they'll be maintained or very short lived. Yeah. We're in our last block of training. So if you've read Ish Urine's residual effects. I know that my block of training is, big, is, is targeted to two, two concepts, maximal strength and an enhancement or maintaining of explosive power. I know that this block of maximal strength will last me 30 days plus or minus five days. There's camp. Camp runs July 31st to August 5th is our calendar, 37 days. Within that 37 days, we only have 22 practices. We only have 11 practices before the first game. So part of our job is there's application, then there's recovery from application. Part of the design of our strength program is not to elicit fatigue. It's to maintain during this period of very intense loading, right. of over-volumizing. Let's face it, five weeks into camp, I mean five days into camp, everybody, trainers, Equipment managers, uh, coaching staff, players, you're, in a, you're, you're jet lagged. I don't care who you are. Yeah. 
So how can I promote recovery? The one thing we can tell them to do that is anabolic in nature is what you hit on before, Jeff, sleep. How can I maximize on my sleep? Well, get a blue, a blue light blocker for your phone or your TV, put a tower to the TV, put your cell phone in the other room and sleep in a cave yeah. like cavemen did. Charles Poliquin told me that back in 1997. 1997, we went to the Mega Power Conference in Cleveland, Ohio. Two speakers, Louis Simmons, Charles Poliquin. Before Charles hit mainstream popularity, before his Poliquin principles hit the, hit the market, before he got more involved in physique trans, uh, transmutation or uh, physique yeah. transformation, there was one, two, four strength coaches in the whole audience. That was it. There was myself, my assistant, Mark Costick. There was Michael Hope, a very close personal friend, like a brother to me, who was a P, one of the best PTs I've ever been around in Syracuse, New York. And there was a guy named Mike Pomondi, who was a BC at the time. That was it. I'm like, you got to be kidding me. Yeah. Here's what's wrong with this country. Case in point, Mel Siff, Louis Simmons, conference in Vegas when the NCSCA conference was there. Yeah. No more than 75 people in a room. Yeah. That was it. Yeah. Thousands at the NSCA conference. Oh. Are you yeah. kidding me? Yeah. Here's what's wrong with this country. Yeah. Here's what's wrong with this profession. Yeah. And then you walk through the Expo Mart or you see all these gadgets and gimmicks. You know, you got people promoting. I get I at least once a month I get this question from somebody. As a football player, should I train in sand? I'm like, do you train in do you play in sand? <laughs> sand destroys the elastic response right. and dissipates forces. Right. If you play beach volleyball, train in the sand. Right. We train on solid ground. For right. every action, equal and opposite reaction. <laughs> Same thing where I see these guys doing Bulgarian split squats or rear foot elevated squats with their foot under a, a foot on top of a half foam roller. For what? <laughs> do we yeah. play in an unstable environment? Right. Our environment do we play on the stable? Right. The grass does not provide instability. Now, if we start playing during periods of earthquakes, right. I may say, okay, or if we play on a right, right. football field, like remember the old-time electric football games? Right. So, see, but this, again, is people trying to make themselves seem like the, the grand wizards. Yeah, right. I'm the wizard of training. Yeah. you got to listen to me. Yeah. And, it's, and they become, they become cult, cult leaders, and you get the cults that follow them. Yes, yes. CrossFit is a cult. Yes. I a brilliant it. one, by the way, because I wish oh, I would have Oh, my God, is it brilliant. I wish I would have come up with the idea. I we both, we both had had jobs. Why didn't I come up with something this stupid? Wow. I'm I love jealous of the guy. Now, don't get me wrong. I like, I love Annie Thorkelson. I'm a, I'm, I'd love to meet her. Her and Serena Williams are my two favorite female athletes. They're great at what they do, but I guarantee they don't train that way. I guarantee it. Annie doesn't do and And I love... Um, Kelly Stark and his book, uh, Supple Leopard, I think it's great. But I'll argue with him to death and debate to death. A kipping pull-up has no yeah. transformation or tra trainability to any movement on, on any sporting activity <laughs> except for an epileptic. Right. And there's, I haven't seen the epileptic Olympics. Have you? <laughs> right, right. I missed out on that. Yeah, so I, I missed out on that too. But I'm, that's not high transferability. And then Bonderchuk spells it out. Right. Ishuran spells it out. Right. Dan Paff spells it out. Charlie, the late great Charlie Francis spelled it out. What are we else are we looking for? Yeah. Instead yeah. of discussing the success of great coaching, great programs, we're looking to be the wizard. Yes. I'm smarter than everybody. Look what I'm doing. Yeah. All my okay. guys are balancing on one foot on a BOSU ball, yeah. lifting weights. Yeah. Yeah. That's a circus act. Yeah.